So much like what Dennis said at the beginning of the presentation, I have the benefit of hearing everything that we went over this morning. So there's gonna be a couple slides that I may briefly touch on. Uh, but I think what we'll, we'll get into is really from the, uh, the manufacturer perspective, you know, what, what is it that we need to be doing when you have a very diverse portfolio and, and you need to really manage that chemical characterization, not as a single study, but as a systemic approach to, to evaluating that large portfolio with varying different types of devices. Um, coming from Cardinal Health, we have a very large portfolio of a lot of different types of devices with varying different risk levels. And that's why it's so critical uh, to use chemical characterization uh, appropriately in, in the biological evaluation. So biological evaluations, we've heard plenty about them. I think Lee started off the day with a really nice explanation of that in, in 1093-1. The p key piece here I wanna highlight again, that chemical characterization, gathering that chemical information, generating it is a critical element, right? We see it in the table, we see it in the literature, uh, we see it in the guideline. It's a critical element to being able to move forward in the valuation. And, and when we think about risk appropriate chemical characterization, then we start thinking about devices in various different risk levels, right? Uh, and part one even starts to talk about that, talking about the different categorizations, right? We talk about the different locations of contact, different durations of contact. So it's really largely defined in, in most cases, those risk levels by that categorization. So that risk-based approach, the biological evaluation, I'm not gonna go into this, uh, but what I do wanna point out is right in that risk evaluation phase in the very center, you see the gathering of a lot of relevant data to then do a, an evaluation and understand what does this mean for my device for the patient's safety. So someone started off this morning uh, with uh, a black box. This is a blue box. <laughs> and, and I think what this is, is what everyone is looking for when they talk about chemical characterization for medical devices. And, and that is that those blueprints for the one size fit all or, or the several different sizes, but the blueprints on how to do chemical characterization for biological evaluation. And I have those blueprints actually right here. So if you can see, uh, this, this is as close as you're gonna get to the actual blueprints for what that means. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a methodology uh, that we can actually look at. And, and see what it means when we look at the different risk levels. Yes, it'd be nice if we actually did have true blueprints to understanding you know, every single device and every single category, what exactly that medical device uh, chemical characterization program would look like. I, I want you to think more and more as we go into these slides, chemical characterization isn't jumping straight into the lab, right? We've heard that already a couple different times. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. There's a lot of steps before going straight into the lab and doing some studies. So think about chemical characterization in its entirety. So how much information is enough, right? There's two components when we really try to boil that down and it's about the quality of the available information, right? Available information. And, and it's also the device risk category that we've been talking about. So in part 18, we talk about information gathering and information generating. If you think about that, during the assessment process, if you gather up adequate, protective, comprehensive information, the more that information is relevant to the assessment of your device to demonstrate safety, the less you're generating additional information, right? So very simple concept. The more information we're gathering, the more relevant it is, the less we're generating. So the less we're doing chemical characterization studies in the lab, more extensive testing, because we've gathered up appropriate data. If we were to then look at the risk levels of devices, low risk devices probably need less data. So the information uh, gathering phase could be easier to satisfy, okay? So in part one, they already start talking about that through that risk management process. 
And if we think about the flow chart, obtaining that chemical characterization, that chemical data, uh, the material characteristics, and then thinking about the material construction, the manufacturing processes, right? A lot of people, I'm sure many of you have heard when, when you're thinking about your chemical characterization, you go straight into what's the device made of? Okay, that's a very relevant and very important piece of the puzzle. But we also have to know, well, how is the device made? You know, how is it packaged? How is it processed? What are some of the processing aids? What are all the processing aids? What's relevant when I actually take this device and that last diamond there and, and actually use it in its clinical setting? You know, how do I then start to understand during that patient device interface, what is going to be exposed to the patient and really start modeling it from that perspective? And in that information gathering phase, do I have enough information? Do I have enough to justify the use of that device? The, do I have enough information about the chemical constituents that would be imparted leaching onto that device? You know, do I have enough information from material suppliers? Do I know enough about the formulation of that device, uh, the way it's manufactured, it's extruded, it's so on and so forth. A lot of different ways to look at that. Of course, once we do that evaluation, that's when we start supplementing in the gaps, right? Not just diving straight into a study, understanding what we had, what we need, and where are those gaps? You know, what testing then needs to be done? Yes, chemical characterization is a great way to start filling in those gaps, you know, gathering up that type of information, generating that data. But the biological testing is also another key element. I think Dennis mentioned it earlier, you know, at some point, you may find yourself going down a rabbit hole with, with the chemistry testing. And in that case, when we're talking about patient safety, it may be that you go back to the biological testing. So we really have to understand where we're trying to go, not get too fixated on what we had originally set out to do um, and, and not look at the data as it's coming in. So that's balancing risk appropriate uh, chemical characterization as well. That last square there obviously is to do the final tox risk assessment. I think Sherry was saying this is why she has tendonitis. So looking at the table, we start off with that physical and chemical information. It starts with the information gathering every single time, right? And so when we think about the device categorization, we're thinking about the location of contact and the contact duration. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. There's a lot of different ways that the chemical compounds can be exposed to the patient, right? It could be exposed to skin, it could be exposed to more invasive tissue, it could be delivered to uh, blood, it could be ingested, inhaled, you know, a lot of different fundamentals in, in dosing. And of course, that's gonna affect, you know, what's an allowable level for any one of these particular compounds, which compounds are more concerning than others because of their absorption profiles. The contact duration, if we were to try to think about it as a mode of uh, transportation, you know, the dose makes the poison. So there's a lot of different ways to get around, uh, but the, the magnitude, uh, the duration, the frequency of, of that dosing is gonna drive a, a major difference. And in fact, when we talk about the risk categories uh, that I'll, I'll postulate next, the duration of exposure and how that exposure happens drives the majority of this risk uh, categorization for devices, and therefore then drives the majority of how you look at that chemical characterization. It's not the only factor, by the way. I, I do wanna say, you know, the, the nuances of the material of construction, we started off at the very beginning, gathering up that information and understanding the device, understanding the materials, nuances of, that mat of those materials, the material science can also drive an element of that risk uh, that risk categorization. But if we were to get very basic, if we were trying to create blueprints, if you will, uh, I, I would say that the contact duration is the primary driving force, um, but not to be considered the only driving force. So keep that in mind. So when we think about the different risk categories on the devices, uh, we, we can start with some very low risk devices. These are the intact skin regardless of duration of contact, right? So it's, it's gonna be for the limited, prolonged, long-term duration of contact. But then when we go through low risk, medium risk, and high risk, 
you'll see the primary driving force is that duration of contact. There's a couple small nuances why we have the asterisk there, um, uh, particularly on uh, the medium risk, but you can see now the, the location of contact is less driving what risk category that device fits in. So here, if we look at risk level one, that intact skin, there's a couple examples here. Uh, what I want to point out when it comes to the chemical characterization, it, it's really important to look at those endpoints, where you're going, where you're going to have to supplement that information. And gathering, gathering up the data most likely is going to entail a lot of the biological testing. It's going to be previous reports of relevant uh, devices or the same device or the same materials or the same manufacturing process and, and focusing a lot on the biological outcomes. And in this case, additional chemical testing likely is going to add little to no additional value in, in that overall assessment, right? In most cases, you're going to have a lot of that biological testing for this risk, la uh, risk category. So those very low risk devices. It's not to say that chemistry doesn't play a part, but it's going to usually provide little additional value. If we look at risk level two, uh, here we have some more examples. Again, it's, it's in that limited duration and various different types of, of uh, location of contact with the exception of intact skin. And here, you know, a lot of the durations of exposure, less than 24 hours, we're not exposing the device to the patient for long durations of time. So what we need to be thinking about is what is the likelihood of, of something to migrate from that material and actually then come out and be exposed to the patient? That likelihood is lower now. Of course, I said at the beginning, you wanna understand your material science. Some materials, that likelihood could be very high, right? So, so there's always gonna be the, the exception to the rule, which is why we don't have those perfect blueprints. You have to understand the data that you're looking at, the situation that you're evaluating, and, and the relevance. In this particular case, using an 80-20 rule, I guess you could kind of say, uh, you'll, you'll notice most of the times these devices with that shorter duration of contact or transient type contact, you're trying to understand more what, what's on the surface, what's, what's uh, the residuals, um, maybe what is possible to leach out in that short duration of time. Uh, that's where you, you could be gaining some additional information from that chemistry. Risk level three. So here is where we start having more prolonged durations. What I want to point out, especially when we start thinking about the device categories and, and the examples here, it's not only the devices that have, say, you know, 24 hours to 30 days of constant contact. It's also the devices that have that repeat exposure to the patient, right? So the categorization, that risk level, is thinking about the patient view of the device. So if a same device is then replaced with another one of the same exact device, and we have that repeat exposure, that's the frequency of that dosing, right? Now we're going into that prolonged exposure, but it's really important to understand how that translates. And I'll, I'll comment again uh, in a couple slides. Uh, it's really important to understand how does that translate into my chemical characterization studies, my, my extraction conditions. Um, it's not necessarily that if I say something is prolonged, that I need to extract something for up to 30 days if I wanted to have simulated use, or I have to do an exhaustive extraction, right, for prolonged. Maybe I do, but most likely you don't. It's, un it's important to understand that device's actual exposure to the patient, not just the patient's exposure of the device, if that makes sense, right? So here, one of the really great things is to understand, you know, what, what kind of endpoints can I satisfy with some good chemistry data? And, and that's where we start getting into more extensive biological endpoints for evaluation. Uh, we start seeing the repeat systemic toxicity studies uh, that may be required for some of these devices, genotoxicity, uh, carcinogenicity, and, and well, actually not in the risk level three, so genotoxicity. Here, that chemical characterization data um, provides a lot of value and avoids potentially some of those, those tests.
Risk level four, as you can probably imagine, those are your long-term duration studies, the ones that have that exposure to the patient greater than 30 days. And here again, we're going to see some of those longer term uh, biological tests being able to uh, be foregone, right? Those endpoints being uh, addressed through a lot of good chemical data. You know, that chemistry data, remember that, that, that graph that we had earlier about information gathering and information generating? It's not to say, I do a chemistry study, I get that chemical data, and that's, that's enough, right? Now I don't have to do that biological testing. Uh, Lise talked about that evaluation stage at the end. It's not, it's not just do the biocompatibility testing or whatever you, you need to do from your plan and then hand over the reports. You have to evaluate. And it's not just because of failures. It could also be because uh, the data is, is, is incomplete to be able to substantiate safety, right? So we have to think in those terms. You know, do I have enough comprehensive data to be able to actually be protective, right? We heard that term as well today. Uh, be protective of the patient based on the exposure. And do I have enough to then substantiate those endpoints as being addressed? Do I have enough for that justification? So a little bit about some of the extraction methods. This would be relevant for both uh, risk category three and four, but I, I want to focus on the four. You know, there's, there's various different types of extractions. We already heard about that earlier. Uh, but what I want to really focus on is, is what I mentioned earlier, really thinking about when you're trying to simulate that clinical use, uh, if you're trying to understand what the actual exposure of the device is to the patient, you, you have to be thinking, well, if this device is in contact with the patient for four hours, right, and it's removed, and the next day a new one is, is exposed to the patient for another four hours or, or 24 hours, whatever that duration is, but it's a finite amount of time, and then they, they perhaps have that exposure to that device chronically for the rest of their life, right? Uh, let's just say that that's the example. That does not mean that you do an exhaustive extraction on the device, right? And a lot of people sometimes forget that because it's going into that, that you know, high risk level four category. Well, that doesn't mean that we're doing the most aggressive extraction. Uh, in this case, we still wanna understand what is that interface of device to patient and, and model that accordingly or be adequately protective in terms of those extraction conditions. So if there's a 24 hour exposure, a 24 hour extraction, or maybe a 72 hour extraction, if we're trying to be protective, is enough, not an exhaustive extraction or, or so on and so forth. Uh, analytical methods, I'm not gonna talk about them. They've been discussed already quite a bit. Uh, of course, understanding the material is really critical to ensuring that your you're adequately protective in your chemical characterization screening techniques or targeted analysis. Uh, for the most part, you're, you're going in with that black box, right? Uh, not knowing what to expect. That information gathering helps to remove that black box and maybe make it a little gray or a little translucent. Uh, you start to see a little bit inside that box. As we know more and more about the material, we know more and more about the suitability of certain analytical techniques to capture the types of compounds that we expect to see. Uh, so that, that process is, is not a trivial one. And a lot of people sometimes say, oh, well, it's just easier to go straight into the lab and start doing some testing. Well, sure, that, that sounds right. Um, but at the same time, you may be missing a whole lot. And that's not the intention of part one through that risk management process, right? You, you're really supposed to understand your material more. And even part 18 says that information gathering phase is to make sure that you're going in with the right information and designing your studies and, and the, the data capture uh, appropriately. So just really revisiting back to the device risk categories. Uh, here we have the different levels that I was uh, discussing, and this is a summary talking about where the chemical characterization uh, may provide more and more data. Remember, chemical characterization is not only about the uh, doing the testing, but also gathering up information. Uh, so here, it's, it's really important to understand where you're trying to go and how you're going to supplement those gaps. That's how you do a risk-appropriate 
uh, chemical characterization program overall. And then therefore, any of the extractable, leachable type studies kind of fall inside of that. That's, that's not a standalone item. Chemical characterization is really more comprehensive than that. Uh, what I have here is it's really important, uh, particularly on the higher risk uh, devices, to make sure that you're adequately protective when you're doing your, your study designs uh, or evaluating that data. So if we look at the different risk levels and we translate that back into biological endpoints, right, what we saw earlier, you start to see very low risk devices. What are the biological endpoints? that are listed there, low and medium risk, combining those together, uh, and the high risk is most comprehensive. You know, the level of chemical characterization is going to increase as we go through those different risk levels for the different devices. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, what, what are the blueprints for the chemical characterization? How much information is really enough? Well, we have to go back and think, you know, where, where do we have enough information that's going to give us the uh, ammunition to address the clinical use. So I do have some considerations to close. Uh, not really blueprints, but close enough. Uh, so when we think about very low risk devices, you know, the kind of chemical information that we're gathering, the different bill, uh, bill of materials, the different known additives, manufacturing processes, processing aids, um, storage conditions, and all of that is to really start understanding what could result and be exposed to a patient, right? It's not, it's not that everything you put in, uh, and I think it was Sherry that talked about it earlier, it's not that if we have the full formulation that we know exactly what's going to be exposed to the patient. You have to do a little bit of, uh, of uh, understanding of what that is. And the more you know about those materials, that material science, the more you can start to understand what that results in, in terms of patient exposure. The low risk devices, all that chemical information that I just mentioned always builds up. Um, but here is where we start thinking more about some of the residuals or surface chemistry, if you will. And that may be adequate, but you really do have to consider, as I mentioned earlier, that material science. You know, is there a particular material or a particular uh, clinical use that, that I do need to think more about some accelerated release of different polymer additives that could be, or, or other types of uh, products that could be exposed to the patient as well. The medium risk is, again, thinking about uh, some adequately protective quantitation on the chemical constituents, both in and, and um, outside of the device, uh, after it has been manufactured, through all of its processes, packaged, uh, and, and really understanding that device as it is going to be exposed to, to the patient. You know, everything that we do when we think about that uh, study design, and when we're thinking about the extraction conditions, is about trying to model what is appropriate when we're thinking about device contacting patient in clinical use, right? It's not about what is analytically feasible. Yes, that's important. Uh, but, but of course, we have to start with what is it that we're trying to model, right? What are we trying to simulate uh, and, and then go ad adequately protective from there? And then uh, in that medium risk category, uh, I, I also say, <clears throat> In addition to gathering up that information, you may do an adequately protective, quote unquote, extractable study. You know, what that looks like, we already saw there's a lot of different ways to do those extractions. You have to make sure it's adequately protective. That, that's the key. You know, that, that is the blueprint, really, that, that sentence right there. And then, of course, understand the materials. And then the high risk is the same thing. Uh, but here, even if I were to gather up all the information and I had some pretty good confidence in the data that I, I collected from the material suppliers, from uh, my own manufacturing processes, uh, so on and so forth. You know, the, the confidence that that is adequate for a high risk device is, is not there. It's not at the same level. So that's where it, it becomes, well, that plus maybe uh, more of a simulated use type study. Uh, would be adequate for me to comprehensively look at what those chemical constituents are that could be exposed to the patient. You know, uh, gathering up that information at the beginning is never 
is never a bad exercise. Um, it's always going to help you, but I don't think in these high risk categories that that exercise is really enough. You know, there's too much. And I think, again, I'm going to go back to Sherry, you, you were commenting, um, in that predictive situation, what was it? Something like only 60% of the time people were able to accurately predict. So when you're in that high risk category, it, it's, there's too much left on the table that you're not addressing without going into some level of chemistry testing. So again, we think about that chemical characterization as a gradient in terms of level of, of, uh, of exercise and effort going into it. Um, here with the high risk is, is when we really need to be thinking about doing those more simulated use studies. Or, of course, uh, I think Pete was saying in the device world, it's, it's not uncommon to have uh, an adequately protective controlled extraction study and stop there, not move into a leachable study. As long as that's adequately protective, then that could be all you need at, in the end. Uh, again, still gathering up the right information to make sure you design the right study to begin with. So with that, um, certainly welcome any questions. Thank you.